little bit nervous junior year again, not only feeling like I was going to be behind, but um, like I said in the beginning of this, public health is so all all over the place, not in an unorganized way, obviously all over the place, but there's so much to it. And I was afraid I wasn't going to find my niche in time. I wasn't going to find the facet that made the most sense to me. Um, I really enjoyed my environmental health classes. Luckily, um, there weren't really, there wasn't really a health education component undergrad. Um, I learned about health education through doing internships and things like that. And then that's what set me up for a health education master's degree eventually. Um, so being able to take the classes that I needed from all these different institutions and then focus on public health once, you know, I was in my junior and senior year at Temple was, was really good. And I think really set me up for success. This is the Public Health Millennial Career Stories podcast, where you'll hear about diverse career stories, career strategies, get tips, and learn from others to help you in your public health career journey. If you want to learn about public health, public health careers, or just hear public health stories, stay tuned because you won't want to miss this. Welcome to the Public Health Millennial Career Stories podcast, episode number 101. Hi everyone, Omari Hutchins here. Thank you all so much for joining me. Be sure to follow me on Instagram at the PH Millennial. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast if you have not as yet. Greatly helps. Leave a five-star review. Let me know what you like about the show. Um, if you'd like to support, you can buy some uh, jerseys like this or, or other things on my store, the phmillennial.com, and you can find the store tab there. As well as if you'd like to support in other ways, you can go to the phmillennial.com and that support definitely enjoyed today's episode uh, definitely enjoyed connecting with this person who has been a huge fan of mine and i've been a, a fan of the work that she does and the passion that she brings be sure to follow her new instagram profile on um, instagram at public health positive um, to, to check out everything that she's going to be uh, posting there but i really enjoyed this conversation i think she shared a lot of great insights especially for health educators or future health educators thinking through your journey and um as well as neurodivergence in the workplace and during school and how how the stigma around that and different things around that but i definitely think you're all going to enjoy this conversation the same way that i enjoyed having it but uh yeah um see you all next week enjoy this episode Today, we have a passionate health educator specifically interested in health behavior, mental health, substance misuse, communicable disease, and risk communication. She got credits at Raritan Valley Community College before completing a Bachelor's of Science in Public Health at Temple University. She then went on to get her Master's of Public Health at Rutgers University. She was a member of the De Beaumont Foundation Year 2020, 40 Under 40 in Public Health. She works as a Community Program Coordinator and Health Educator at Bernard's Township Health Department. We have Caitlin Cartochio, MPH, MCHES, DRCC. I hope that I got your stadium correctly and welcome yeah. to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It is, it is my pleasure. And I know that we've uh, connected on Instagram. I'm chatting, chatting every now and again. And you're, you're a huge supporter. And um, I, I love the work that you're doing uh, in, in your life. So I'm glad to have you on. And I look forward to hearing more about your insights and your story. Yeah, thank you. I almost wore my public health millennial shirt. I thought that would have like, would have matched a little bit, probably. <laughs> yeah, that would have been awesome. Man. Thank you for the purchase. Thank you. Um, so how, how are you doing and how you've been coping during this time? Um, it's been pretty tough. We are feeling a little bit of a breath of fresh air right now. Um, so I work at a local health department. So we've really been not on the front lines with people who've been sick, but front lines in terms of working with businesses and schools, um, the general public asking questions about COVID. Um, you know, obviously we're coming up on, I feel like our two year uh, kind of came in in January when we first heard about COVID here at the health department, but I know we're approaching the two year mark of basically like when the world shut down. Um, and as time has gone on, I feel like people have gotten more information. There is more, there are more credible resources out there. Um, organizations have made the information easier to understand. So we're getting a little bit less calls from the public, um, but we're still working pretty closely with schools and businesses and doing contact tracing and things of that nature. And 
yeah, answering any questions that come along. Um, but we're starting to get back to, I guess people can say like more normal things. Um, so I've been able to go back to doing some of my municipal alliance and uh, other health educator duties uh, instead of just COVID stuff all the time. So that's been nice. Yeah, I can imagine. And thank you for all the work that you're doing. I uh, greatly appreciate you. And we need more people like you out there doing this great work. So appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and and I'll definitely dig into more about how COVID came in and affected your work and all of that when, when we get uh, more to that part of the story. Yeah. Um, so tell me, how do you identify and tell us a little bit about your personal background? Um, my name is Caitlin Cartoccio. Um, I use she, her, hers pronouns. Um, oh my gosh, who am I? That's a good question. No, <laughs> um, uh, personal background. So I'm from New Jersey. I am from Hillsboro, New Jersey. Uh, I currently live in Somerville, which is like a town over. Um, I've lived in Philadelphia. I went to Temple University. Um, moved back to New Jersey, and I currently work at the Berners Township Health Department, which is in Basking Ridge, New Jersey. Um, I actually did an internship here um, when I was still studying at Temple, so that's kind of how I ended up here. Um, but basically, just bouncing back and forth between Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Um, still visit there a lot. Um, I'm married. I don't know if, if we're going into that like type of detail. I'm married. Um, <laughs> I have two cats. Those are my kids. <laughs> Uh, what, are, what are their names? Uh, Crash and Arwen. <laughs> My husband named Crash, like after Crash Bandicoot, and uh, Arwen is after the elven princess in Lord of the Rings. So, a little nerdy, but we love them. And they're our kids, basically, our fur children right now. Well, that is awesome. That is awesome. Well, thank, thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. And uh, yeah, I used to play a lot of Crash Bandicoot when I was uh, younger, and that PlayStation 1 came out. Yeah, that was, that was my jam. That was my jam. <laughs> I wanted video games so bad as a kid. Um, my mom, sorry, mom. Mom didn't let me have them. She did let me have a Game Boy, so I played a lot of Pokemon as a kid. That was my big thing. Um, I knew when we got a boy cat, I knew his name was going to be something video game related. I knew it was going to be either Yoshi or Crash or something like that. Um, but now I can play all the video games I want technically because I'm an adult and I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is true. That is true. I'm a huge Pokemon fan as well. Um, yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, so before we get into more of your story, what does public health mean to you? Oh, man. Public health really is the front line of defense. That's what public health means to me. Um, my supervisor came up with this quote, but... I think it still really rings true. Public health is the best insurance policy you can have. Um, you don't see public health unless things really go awry. Case in point, things like COVID. You know, we work behind the scenes. We don't do any of this for fame or glory or anything like that. Um, we're working hard to keep people healthy in the background so that um, bigger things don't happen down the road you know we're really that front line that primary um primary prevention if you will if we're talking like primary secondary tertiary and all that um you know we're the ones doing the screenings we're the ones that are putting out the health education information um we're the kind of the first ones there uh, and i didn't really even know about public health until i got to college obviously very thankful i found it but Public health to me is just all encompassing. You know, there's so many different facets to it, whether you're talking biostatistics or epidemiology or health administration or, or, um, or health education, anything like that. You really can go anywhere and do anything with public health. Um, I don't know if that's like one simple thing, but it's all encompassing and it really is the front line, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. Pre prevention is, is key. And um, exactly. yeah, I appreciate you sharing all, all of that. Um, okay, so you got some credits at Raritan Valley Community College before you went on to get get your uh, public health degree at Temple University. Tell tell me a little bit about the process. I guess like coming out of high school and then going yeah. into uh, higher education. So I've always known I wanted to go into some sort of health field. I never knew when I was younger. I kind of didn't know where and what direction. Um, I feel like in middle school, I watched, as many people did, watched a lot of like Law and Order SVU and Grey's Anatomy and things like that. Um, 
so for some reason in my my first my first thought was I want to be a forensic pathologist and then somehow went from forensic pathologist to I like working with kids because one of my first jobs was at a summer camp um I like working with kids maybe I want to be a pediatrician and then sometime in high school I decided oh nursing nursing looks like an amazing field to get into you work in so many different places I'm going to go to school for nursing so I started at Temple as a it was called a university studies major. Um, and then you would take nursing courses and then you would apply to the nursing school or apply to a different nursing school if you wanted um, at a different school. Now it's different now. Um, and any temple people listening can correct me with this. I think you get directly into the nursing program now. I think that was a more of a couple of years ago type of thing. So I started taking my nursing classes. I really enjoyed it. Um, some of it was really tough though. Um, I am not, a, I, I do love biology and I do love chemistry and things like that, but taking a lot of those classes all at the same time was pretty tough. Um, and then I took a microbiology class and there was a part of the microbiology class where they always talked about, it was called like the public health corner. Um, and I was like, public health, I, you know, don't know what that is, but sounds good, whatever. And then I realized, oh, in the, um, at one point, it was the College of Health Professions and Social Work, I believe, when I was at Temple. Now it's the College of Public Health. Um, I was like, oh, there's a public health major. I wonder what those, I wonder what those people do with that degree. Um, it was my understanding that a lot of people who wanted, who were doing public health were planning on going into things like kinesiology, nursing. Um, they would do that in order to get into medical school or you know, apply to medical school instead of a biology degree. Um, to me, the public health people at first were the ones that didn't want to do dissections. They were kind of freaked out in anatomy and physiology. They weren't really interested in the inner workings of the body. So I kind of thought it was funny. I thought, oh, they don't want to do dissections. They don't want to learn about how the heart works. I wonder why. So that was my first perspective. And then actually it was during an, 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 excuse me, an anatomy and physiology uh, late night study session. I was explaining muscle contraction to my study group at you know 2.30 in the morning or whatever it was. And one of them said, you're really good at teaching this. You should be like a health teacher or something. And I thought, I never really thought about that. I've, you know, I was remembering health class in high school, you know, didn't really get too, too much out of health class in high school, but health teacher, teaching health, health education. Went to go talk to my um, advisor and she said, you know, what you're talking about and what you sound interested in is public health. And I started reading the curriculum and I thought, oh my goodness, I've been in the wrong major this whole time. Love nurses, still friends with a lot of the people that I was originally in the pre-nursing program with, and they've gone on to be nurses. Um, a lot of them switched from nursing to, like I said, kinesiology, biology, people changed majors and things like that. Um, I found public health and I stayed with it. Uh, so I made that decision, I think midway through my sophomore year, it comes up in my Facebook memories every once in a while, but like when I decided to switch, uh, I switched to public health and I thought, oh my gosh, I still want to graduate in four years. How am I going to still graduate in four years? Um, Raritan Valley Community College is an awesome community college that I'm very lucky to live like 20 minutes away from. Um, I feel like community colleges definitely don't get enough credit and RV, as we call it here, has a lot of really good classes, really good professors who work very extensively in the field that they're teaching. Um, and I managed to get, I think my nutrition class, public speaking, and a couple of other um, general education classes that I needed. Um, I took those during the summer in order to graduate in four years. I know now not graduating in four years isn't the end all be all, but I feel like at 19 or 20 years old, that was the, the pressure to graduate in four years was there. Um, I think it's something I put on myself, um, but getting those credits at RV allowed me to focus on public health only classes when I was back at Temple. Um, which I was really grateful for. And I was able to get all my credits done in time. And I did end up graduating in four years. It was awesome. That is awesome. And, and thank you for, for sharing that journey into learning about public health and everything like that. Where was the thought process in that thinking about like 
getting credits from a community college as opposed to just continuing on at Temple and doing everything there? That was, I hate to say it, but at the time this was, and again, not to date myself too much. This is like 2009, 2010. I graduated from Hillsborough in 2008. And I feel like the thought process at the time was if you go to a community college, you're not going to go anywhere, which is a complete, completely false statement. And especially, like I said, RV is a fantastic school. And again, anyone who lives in my area is very lucky to be able to go there and get the credits that they do. Um, I think community colleges don't get enough credit. I feel like we're telling these 16, 17, 18 year old kids that they need to make a decision about their life right now. Um, and the major that they pick is what they have to stick with for the rest of their life. And that, and that's not the, you know, that's not the case. I think I felt a lot of pressure. Again, I think a lot of this was self-inflicted pressure. Um, I felt like if I switched from nursing to public health that I was failing somehow, I felt like if I take these credits from a community college, something is wrong with me. Um, again, now looking back, however many years later, you know, almost like 15 ish years later, um, I know, again, that's not the case. I know that, you know, had I decided, uh, let me, you know, let me go back to RV for a little bit. Let me think about what I want to do. Let me take some, you know, um, what do they call it? Oh, health, like health sciences related classes. Maybe I can figure out what I want to do. That would have been a perfectly, perfectly wonderful, normal thing to do. At the time, I was putting pressure on myself that I had to stay at the four-year school and figure it out. Um, I work with a group of high school students now um, as part of my job here, and I make every effort to tell them, to, or to my juniors and my seniors especially, who are applying to colleges and you know looking for majors and they're visiting schools and things like that, that it's okay to switch. You don't have to stay with the same major that you go into your freshman year with. Um, I know there's statistics, and I don't know them off the top of my head, but I know that there's statistics saying, you know, this percentage of students switch their major, this percentage of students um, switch schools after a certain amount of time. Um, I know I'm getting a little bit off topic, but the thought process was basically, I feel like I'm failing almost if I'm switching my major. Um, and like I said, once I started looking at the classes that I was gonna be taking as a public health major, that is when I realized this isn't, this isn't wrong. This, this is definitely the right thing to do. You're going to enjoy your classes. You're going to enjoy what you're doing. You're going to enjoy sitting in, you know, three hour lectures. It's going to be fine. Um, it's okay. You're going to write that 90 page grant uh, application. That's part of your capstone um, and everything's going to work out. I feel like I got pretty lucky. Um, I don't like to say a lot of things in life are based on luck because, you know, hard work really is a the majority of the component, but um, Temple is a fantastic school for public health. Um, I got very lucky that the school that I went to as a pre-nursing student or, you know, an undeclared student happened to be a fantastic public health school, and I was able to be educated in the way that I was and, you know, do the, do the internships and the field work that I did and work with the professors that I was able to work with. I got lucky in that aspect, I think. Yeah, and, and, and that makes a lot of sense. And thank you for sharing that. And I feel like I had the same type of fears when I decided not to continue pursuing becoming a, a medical doctor mm -hmm. and, and saying like thinking you're a failure, but I think it's really just flipping the perspective to understand that you're going to be doing something else that is just as or even more impactful um, and, and it's, there's nothing wrong with, with that switching. And I think like changing our mind, especially around like these yeah. big things, like our career and stuff is a, is a huge superpower. Um, but, but I appreciate you sharing that. Okay. So considering that you said you took most of your courses, you know, you took a lot of your co coursework through community college and when you went back to temple or however that worked out, you did strictly public health classes. Was that like helpful in, in that? In, in that work, yeah, tell me, tell me about that. In a way, um, so when I started, the way Temple did, I think most schools do, again, 
I can be corrected. I think the way that most schools do it is that your first like freshman, sophomore year, you're mostly doing general education classes. And then you're doing a little bit of your major to kind of like tease it and throw it in there. And then, you know, junior and senior year is really when you take your higher level, your capstones and your um, major specific like general education or yeah, ma major specific general education requirements. Um, so I took the, the majority of my classes were done at Temple. Um, and I just took those summer classes at RV just to make sure that everything um, kept moving the way it was supposed to. Um, I, again, was lucky that Temple had some really good general education classes. It worked out so that I got all of those out of the way. So by the time I didn't really fall behind, which was really nice. I was afraid that I was going to come in as a public health major junior year, and I was going to be behind and not know anything. And all the other juniors that were in my classes were going to be really far ahead of me. Thank goodness they weren't. I only had a little bit of catching up to do. And like I said, taking those classes that I did at RV got me caught up. Um, I actually also took, I forgot to mention this, um, my first epidemiology class was actually taken at Rutgers. It was an online epidemiology class. Actually, fun fact, only my, my epidemiology classes, both undergrad and graduate, have both been online from Rutgers, which is kind of ironic. So being able to pull from Rutgers and being able to pull from RV and doing all my gen ed classes at Temple basically set me up to be able to take all my public health classes junior and senior year at Temple and really just be able to focus on it. And I think that really helped me um, be able to, I was a little bit nervous junior year again, not only feeling like I was going to be behind, but um, like I said in the beginning of this, public health is so all, all over the place, not in an unorganized way, obviously, all over the place, but there's so much to it. And I was afraid I wasn't going to find my niche in time. I wasn't going to find the facet that made the most sense to me. Um, I really enjoyed my environmental health classes, luckily. Um, there weren't really, there wasn't really a health education component undergrad. Um, I learned about health education through doing internships and things like that. And then that's what set me up for a health education master's degree eventually. Um, so being able to take the classes that I needed from all these different institutions and then focus on public health once you know, I was in my junior and senior year at Temple was, was really good. And I think really set me up for success. Yeah. And what, what would you attribute to you being able to niche down on your interests con considering that we know that public health, was it, was it just like those internships that you, that you got to do or were there other, other experiences? I don't know if you'd call it an experience, but, um, I knew biostatistics wasn't going to be for me. Um, I am not a math fan at all. <laughs> I appreciate math and people who do math well um, are superheroes to me. Uh, I always say that I, I did the classes that I needed to to get my degrees. So whether that was college algebra and undergrad or, you know, the intro to biostatistics class and the inferential statistics class I took for my master's, um, I did the math that I needed to do to get by. And those weren't my best grades. I'm not going to lie. Uh, so I knew it wasn't going to be biostatistics. Um, I definitely had an interest in epidemiology, but again, there was a little bit too much math involved in that sometimes. Um, I don't think there really is at the career level for epidemiology, not saying that there's zero math involved, but I feel like the epidemiology classes in at least the ones I took undergrad and I guess even masters really, um, it made me think that there was going to be math involved every single day. Um, something more than, you know, two plus two equals four, that type of thing. Um, health administration was interesting, but it just didn't, it was there and I liked it. And I thought maybe it was really between environmental and health education. Um, I really enjoyed, I don't know, I just had a really good um, professor at Temple for environmental health. And I thought his class was very interesting. Um, that was when I started learning about things like fracking and air quality and all of that. And now I know there's a, you know, an even bigger world of environmental health. Um, and then once I interned here at the health department, actually, I learned, you know, environmental health that can go um, towards being a registered environmental health specialist or an REHS. Um, I thought that was interesting. That's definitely a path that I could take. 
Um, but really the idea of teaching someone either, you know, not, not necessarily teaching them a health behavior theory, but giving them information with health education theories in mind and that being able to have an impact on what people learn and ultimately what health behaviors they do. I also have a huge interest in psychology and human behavior in general. Um, so that's really where health education popped out to me. And I thought, you know what, that's what I'm going to pursue. Again, if uh, at, at the time I was probably thinking if it's not health education, oh no, it's not going to be anything. Um, now I know, you know, looking back, it's okay. You would have had environmental health or health administration or honestly, any of the other parts of public health are great too. You would have been okay. <laughs> well, I'm glad I'm in hindsight and reflecting that you could share that you, you're going to be okay for those people that are struggling with with those those thoughts in the in their mind right now so I, I appreciate that um and then you during your time at temple you had an internship with bernard's township health department who you currently work for so tell me how how did you get this internship and like what what, what did you do in it initially so temple required you to do two internships um and they were during your senior year um, so this is going, this was going into my senior year and I knew I had the two internships set up for um, the fall and the spring. And I thought I want to dip my toe into every part of public health that I can. Um, and I had done some other like little volunteer work in Philadelphia and I knew, you know, certain things that I was interested in public health, certain things that I wasn't. Um, and I was actually taking health behavior and psychology, which was a class that was offered at Temple. And my professor, uh, Dr. Laura Taylor, who I still keep in contact with actually, um, said, you know, on her uh, syllabus, it said that she works with the New Jersey Department of Health, or she still is to this day. And I thought, cool, New Jersey Department of Health, health department. Okay, never really thought about that. So I asked her, do you know any health officers, or I, I don't know what term I use, I probably said people who run health departments, because I didn't know what health officer or director of health was really. Um, I said, do you know any in Somerset County, which is where I'm from, because at that point, you know, I was uh, like winding down to go back to um, Hillsborough for the summer. She said, yeah, and she wrote down a couple health officers names, I reached out to them. Um, Lucy Forgione from Bernard's Township reached back out to me. She said, you know, hey, we can use an intern in the spring. Um, here's what you would be doing. Here's who you'd be working with. I thought, great. I'm going to work at this cute little health department. Um, the building, it's like a little carriage house um, to town hall, which is was actually once the John Jacob Astor estate. So Bernard's Township is very, very beautiful. So beautiful town hall, cute little health department. That great. I'm going to learn all about health departments. And again, at the time, it was probably like a check it off the list to see if I like it or not. I went to my first few health clinics with the employees here and I thought, oh my gosh, they know the community. They know these people. They know what's happening in the community. They know what programs work for the community. People come to the programs, people learn, people are empowered. Oh my gosh, this is amazing. And I thought, how am I going to work at a health department? That's really cool. Um, so I interned here probably about two months before I started that um, that camp job that I mentioned. Um, and I don't know if you want me to go into the whole how I got hired thing yet, but that's how I ended up here as an intern. Well, well thank you for sharing how you got here, got there as an intern. Um, and we'll get a little bit more into how you got high, re rehired or got it. Whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, got, got back into a full-time position. Yeah. Um, what, what was the, the other internship around the risk communications lab into? Oh, yeah. So my other two um, uh, internships, like the official internships, so you had to do a 200-hour and a 400-hour um, at Temple. So the 200-hour was at the Youth Health Empowerment Project at Philadelphia Fight. Um, so that one was a youth drop-in center um, in uh, Center City, Philadelphia. That was an amazing experience. I did a lot of cataloging, um, a lot of um, like little presentations for um, the people who would drop in. Uh, they had like a library that the um, individuals can use. They had um, just all different, all different things just to make sure that a lot of it was either kids who didn't have anywhere to go after school, 
Um, we had homeless individuals, houseless individuals that would um, come in, use the computer, read the books, um, get a snack. It was usually um, they would come in and they would get those services, but in turn, there was a health education aspect to it. Um, a lot of it was um, presentations like on safe sex. We did a lot of like condom demonstrations and things like that, giving out condoms, giving out safe sex kits, um, a lot of outreach into um, different areas of Philadelphia. Um, and that was my fall internship. And then in the spring, I interned with the risk communication lab, uh, also at, um, right at Temple. Um, was very lucky to work with Dr. Bass, who is the head of the risk communication lab. Um, she's also, again, I'm not 100% sure now, and I'm so sorry, Dr. Bass. I can't remember who's the head of the department now, but at the time she was the head of the department. So I thought, oh my gosh, I get to work with her. This is really cool. Um, and basically the risk communication lab looked at health literacy um, at, the, at that point and how we can improve health literacy in order to influence health behavior. Um, so the project that I worked on for on the risk communication lab when I was there is they were looking at a study on dirty bombs. Um, and what they did is they took the CDC information about dirty bombs, which um, it's an explosive device. And instead of the, the whole um, damage aspect to them is not so much the, the force, but dirty bombs sometimes release like a different chemical. They release shrapnel, they release like glass, sand, things afterwards um, to harm people. So they were usually smaller, um, smaller explosives. Um, I know it sounds kind of random, but the whole point was is the risk communication lab took the dirty bomb information that was on the CDC website under their like risk communication section. Um, and they hooked people up to a bio, like a, like a whole um, bio, oh my gosh, what was the word? See, this is the part where I mess up. Biofeedback? I think it was that, yeah, I think that was the right word. Um, and basically like, where were they, like there was a camera looking at them, where were their eyes going? Um, we took their heart rate, we took um, like their, even the blood oxygen, um, if they were sweating. Basically they wanted to see if they created an easier to read health education material on dirty bombs, would people be able to read that easier than the CDC material? I'm gonna get the numbers wrong off the top of my head, but basically um, CDC releases amazing information. It's all very um, accurate and timely, um, but it is at a higher reading level than the average population and then average popul or the um, higher reading level than the average population in Philadelphia as well. So we had people from the community coming in. We would have a set of people read the information that the risk communication lab came up with. And we would have people read the one that the CDC came up with, um, ultimately to see are the people stressing more reading the CDC one than they are the one that the risk communication lab um, looked at. And really they were a lot calmer reading, um, in, in very short words, they were calmer reading the, um, the easier to read one from the risk communication lab. And Dr. Bass ended up um, applying for an NIH grant with this information. Um, at that point I graduated and I lost a little bit of touch, but I still follow risk communication lab, obviously like on um, Facebook and things like that. I'm still friends with Dr. Bass on Facebook and I'm seeing all the great stuff that they're still doing. Um, it's funny, they, I'm not leaving Bernard's obviously, but they posted something about a position at the risk communication lab. And I was like, right there, <laughs> I was there once before, but that was a really great opportunity because I got to work in a research lab, um, which again was another another um, area of public health that I wanted to dip my toe in to see if I was interested in it. And I definitely was interested in it. I'm just not sure I could do research labs all the time. Um, I wanted, there wasn't a whole lot of, un unless we were working, actually, you know, working with somebody in the lab, there wasn't a whole lot of face-to-face -face interaction with people. And that was something that I really liked. I liked working one-on-one -on -one with people or not even one-on-one -on -one, speaking to a group of people or working with um, a group of some kind. Yeah, well, thank you for sharing that. that that's really awesome that, that people are doing research literally on uh, like 
how people are stressing over reading the CDC material over this other type of material that's, that's like wild to even think about. But uh, that, I'd be explaining it wrong again if any if uh, Dr. Bass, if you're listening to this, sorry if I messed it up. It was a it was a couple of years. It was almost ten years ago at this point, and I might be misremembering it. But it was a really cool experience. I'm very grateful that I got to work with both Philadelphia Fight. Um, I believe I don't know if YHEP is um, working or or in. Um, is a program that they run anymore, but I know Philadelphia Fight is still a very successful program in Philly. I know the Risk Communication Lab is still there, and those were two really great experiences that I got to have while I was at Temple. Yeah, yeah, that's, that is awesome. I uh, appreciate you sharing that. So you went on and got your Master's of Public Health at Rutgers University. When, when did you know that you wanted to get your MPH, and then what was the thought, or what was the thought process for you wanting to pursue a Master's of Public Health? So it was actually while I was here interning. So the woman that I was working with, um, her name's Danielle. I don't know. I, I, again, I don't think she's going to watch. I don't know why I'm like shouting people out. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, uh, Danielle Cooper, who was uh, in this position before I was. Um, so she's the person who I interned under. She actually did some, um, she actually was at Temple for a little bit as well. So we um, connected on that level, but she was the community programs coordinator and health educator before I was. So that's who I worked directly with when I was interning. And she had she had an MPH and I said, hey, you know, I'm graduating, should I get an MPH? Cause I think something that a lot of um, undergraduate, you know, college juniors and seniors think about is do I wanna go right in for my master's now or do I wanna wait a couple of years, get a job, um, see if I can get them to pay for some portion, maybe even like work at a college and, you know, pay for it that way. Um, I said to her, should I you know, go for my master's? And she said, absolutely. Um, make sure it's a topic that you're interested in. And then that's really where the whole, do I want health administration? Do I want environmental? Do I want health education came from? Uh, and at the time it was actually the University of Medicine and Dentistry or UMDNJ here in New Jersey. Um, and they had a master's of public health program in health education and behavioral sciences. Uh, and I thought that sounds amazing. I did look at Temple as well, because obviously that's my, that's my first alma mater. That's my first love. Um, I loved living in Philly. Um, at the time, they only had a master's in social and behavioral sciences, which is an incredible concentration but it didn't have that health education aspect that I really wanted. And I thought if I go to Rutgers or UMDNJ, like I said, I'm going to get to focus in, you know, especially on health education. Um, so that's where I ended up applying. I took the GRE. Wow. For almost forgot what it was. <laughs> the GRE took that um, and applied and got into at the time, like I said, UMDNJ, um, it was sometime during, I think my sophomore year, of um, being, I guess you can call it, actually it's not sophomore year, my second year, yeah, my second year uh, in my graduate program uh, that the merger became final and it became Rutgers. Uh, so Rutgers is what's officially on my, um, my, my diploma and very happy I did it, very happy I did it right out of, um, right out of college. Again, I think that's, it, that's gonna differ from person to person. Um, I did not know I was going to be working for Bernard's Township right out of, out of Temple. Uh, I happened to, again, I don't know if I'm skipping around too much, but uh, Danielle ended up leaving Bernard's Township and I found, I heard, heard about it and I thought, oh my gosh, the job is, you know, available. <clears throat> I should go and see if I can interview, even if it's just for fun. Not for fun, like I didn't take it seriously, but for fun, I was 21 and graduating with you know my bachelor's and I thought you know no one's not no one's gonna want me but who's gonna want someone right out of school who knows um but I did work with Danielle that that prior year I did work you know I I, I was familiar with the programs I was familiar with the town having done the internship uh so I interviewed for that job in April of 2012 I got the job, I graduated from Temple, and I started like four days after graduation. In hindsight, I probably should have given myself a little bit more of a break. So um, any students that are considering starting jobs right after college, give yourself a little bit of a break, maybe. Um, again, I don't really regret it because 
everything happens for a reason and you do things for a reason. I thought I was going to be going to grad school full time and working. I, I thought, you know, any job I could really get right out of college on the side, whether it was a, a retail job or something remote or something um, at like a, a local business, I didn't know what it was going to be. I thought I'm just going to be going to school full time and I have to supplement that somehow. Let me find a job somewhere. Um, and I was able to, like I said, interview for the position that I interned under. And again, I don't want to call it luck because I worked really, really hard to get to this position, but it worked out really, really nicely that I was able to get hired at the place that I interned and I'm still here. Okay. Okay. That, that, that's awesome. And uh, thank you for sharing that. And firstly, I wanted to say, I, I think it's good to shout out people um, and say their names. I think it just puts good energy into the, into the atmosphere. I hope so. I just didn't want to sound lame or anything like that. <laughs> no, no. So feel free to shout out as many people as you like to, <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just so we, we're clear there. But yeah, that, that, that's really awesome. And I'm glad that you, you shared that. And I think even you say like you're going in to do this for fun or like the, the interview for fun or just applying for fun um just taking that chance and and seeing if if it's something that works out because as you said you had the experience there you worked on the programs you knew a lot of the knowledge so that's definitely like a step up against someone who probably has a master's degree and has some experience but doesn't know the specific things because I'm guessing you're just going to get in there and just start running a lot quicker than other people as well hit the ground running basically um I did find out that um my supervisor and I uh, Lucy were really close and uh she she admitted later it was definitely a courtesy interview because again Danielle had had an MPH in this position um and again I was coming out as a baby from Temple with my bachelor's of science which I was extremely proud of don't get me wrong but again I didn't know what I was doing but I went for went in for the interview they granted me the interview which I was very grateful for um, I think I was uh, amazed at how everything went. They were amazed with how everything went. Um, it, it just worked out really, really, really well. Um, again, it, it, I took a chance even actually, I, I wanted, that's a, something good that Temple did is, uh, we had to take a class called professional seminar. Uh, again, not sure if it's still offered or if it, um, is, you know, if, if they have something in place. Um, but Dr. Nikki Frank was my teacher for that. Um, she's amazing. Uh, she's all over the news now. She's also Temple's uh, fencing coach and she's awesome. And she happened to be my teacher for professional mm -hmm. seminar and they recommended any place you've ever interned before or did any work at, reach out to them. I think this was probably January or February of senior year, but that would make sense. Um, they said, reach out what's the worst that's going to happen, see if there's anything that's come across their desk, even if maybe the position didn't open up at the place that you've interned at, um, maybe they know another position that would be a good fit for you. Uh, so that's what I did. I emailed Lucy. I said, hi, I'm graduating in a couple months. I really enjoyed interning at the Burns Township Health Department. Uh, do you know of any other health departments that may be hiring? Uh, do you know of any positions? Do you need me to come back and intern? I, I didn't, I, you know, I, I really thought anything. Um, they get really busy here in the spring. There's a lot that happens in Burns Township, a lot of like community events and things like that. So I thought, hey, if you need me, I don't know what I'm going to be doing. So <laughs> count me in. And she said, you know, I, you probably heard um, the position is open. We're, you know, currently looking for somebody with an MPH, but, you know, um, if you, if anything comes across our desk, we'll let you know. I think I ended up emailing again just to check in. And that's when um, the interview was offered, basically, if I'm remembering my train of thought correctly. Yeah, so well, shout out to that professional series and that advice to, to just, I don't, and I think that's great advice that everyone should apply now if they're looking for jobs or thinking just about poke them. Yeah, <laughs> just exactly. Poke exactly. In a nice way, obviously. <laughs> don't badger them, but you know just check in you really can't hurt too much I don't think yeah yeah definitely definitely so okay so you started that job a couple of days after graduating from your bachelor's and then you start your MPH program was that tough to balance in the beginning and then I know also during your MPH you had other positions that we're going to talk about in a little bit so first answer this question and then we get into this 
Um, it was difficult to balance. Uh, I definitely underestimated how much it was going to be. Uh, let's see. So I started in May and then I started um, the job in May, had the summer. That was the first summer again that I hadn't taken summer classes, mind you, since, you know, ever, because I took them all four years of college. Um, I would go to I'd go to Temple for, you know, the regular semester and then summer I would come home, take classes at RV and Rutgers, go back to Temple, summer, RV and Rutgers, things like that. Um, so then when my master's classes started in the fall, I thought, oh my goodness, <laughs> I'm taking, um, I'm, I, was, I, I dropped down to part-time because doing both full-time would have probably been impossible, but probably also a, a poor mental health choice as well. Um, it was tough to balance. I was only taking two or three classes at a time. Um, it was difficult to, to manage the time, mostly because of the timing of classes. They did offer a lot of evening classes, um, but at the time they weren't offering all evening hours. A lot of the classes were in the middle of the day. Obviously, I couldn't go to classes in the middle of the day because I would be at my job. So balancing that was pretty tough. And then uh, for some reason, I made the decision to move out of my parents' house midway through my first year of grad school to move in with my now husband. So then I was managing my first apartment by myself, technically, and my master's program and working full time. It was a lot to balance. I sometimes look back and I go, I'm like, how did you do that? Because sometimes things now get so complicated and crazy, but I look back and I think you were managing a whole lot more then. Um, but I was able to do it. Um, again, a lot of the classes were offered at night. So I would go from working in Bernard's, you know, uh, eight to four thirty, and then drive down to New Brunswick and have class from six to nine. I would do that probably two or three times a week. Um, so some late, later not late, late nights, but you know, if, once you've been working all day and then you're sitting in class for three hours, it can be a lot. It could be really tiring. I'm glad I did it the way I did. Um, I probably finished my master's in a slower, at a slower pace than I would have liked to. Um, Cause at that point, again, we love the degree. Sometimes the classes and everything in between can be a little tiring, a little bit cumbersome. I, I think by the time I was done, I was ready to be out of there. Uh, but I'm glad I took it at the speed that I did, because I think if I tried to do again, I don't think I could have done both full time legally, <laughs> but I also don't think that would have been very smart uh, mental health wise. And, um, you know, I still wanted to have relationships with people and, you know, do things outside of work and school. Um, so balancing it was tough, but it was doable. Well, yeah, I can imagine it, it, it being very tough, but I'm, I'm glad that you made it out on the other side and uh, everything is, is going well. Um, and I'll, I'll also shout out to you, um, marrying your then boyfriend, <laughs> because I can <laughs> guess that, that was a little bit risky as well, <laughs> at least at the time. Isn't it always though? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly, right? No, but I couldn't have done, I, 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 you know, when I was living with my parents, obviously they were incredibly supportive. Um, they were incredibly supportive of me working, obviously, and going to school. Um, moving out was probably not the best like financial choice and things like that, but we had been dating for, not to get like on the personal side of things, but we had been dating for a while at that point. We actually met in high school. Um, we both ended up going to Temple, not on purpose, but um, he graduated from Temple like winter 2013 and we had the opportunity to move in together and I thought this is a great idea. He really, um, you know, he was there for me, you know, he would wait up for me to come home from my long day of work in school. He would make sure that there was food in the fridge and he would cook me dinner and, you know, make sure I had like a nice, quiet, comfortable place to do my homework. Uh, he would help me like, uh, you know, if my laptop broke, he would help me look up to find a different one. You know, he would make sure my car was working and things like that, all to make sure that I finished the degree that I wanted. So I definitely couldn't have done it without really him or my parents. Again, you know, I lived with them for part of it, but the majority of the work was done uh, living with him. And he really got me through, got me through, got me through grad school. <laughs> 
that's that's awesome to hear shout out to supportive partners that really Thanks, hold Mike. it down <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's awesome that's awesome and, and high school sweethearts as well that's that's, that's pretty dope, that's pretty dope as well. we met in marching band <laughs> <laughs> okay okay awesome awesome oh. all right so so during your mph you were a field work student at the rutgers school of public health tell me a little bit about that so um, we ended up doing, uh, we had to do two semesters of field work. Again, I'm trying to make sure I remember everything properly. Um, and the field work was to be done in one location. It was like field work one and field work two. Um, and you had to do a project of some kind. Um, again, I know it sounds stupid, some kind, but you had to do a project with the organization that you were working with. Um, so mine was through the Rutgers School of Alcohol Studies. Uh, they do an incredible, it's changed from year to year, but every summer they do this incredible um, Rutgers School of Alcohol Studies um, and, or no, what's it called? Summer School, Summer School of Addiction Studies. Oh man, I'm going to look up the name and I'm going to get it wrong. I feel bad. But basically it, it's, again, the, the program itself has fluctuated. At, at one point, it was like a two-week residential program of all education Um the latest in addiction studies and summer school of addiction summer school of addiction studies that's what it was there's a lot of s's and a's and stuff that's why it gets confusing um when i was working with the um center for alcohol studies they um were obviously helped helped run it they were the main people component behind it but i was able to actually attend uh the week-long program and it was absolutely incredible to see that this program that they put on but um I worked with Phil McCabe, who um, worked at the Rutgers uh, School of Alcohol Studies, and I knew I wanted to do, obviously, a health education project because that was my concentration, um, but I wanted to see how I could marry the substance misuse things that I do at work with, you know, another organization. Um, so that's how I started working with him and we ended up doing, or we ended up doing, I ended up doing, um, an informational brochure, um, having to do with LGBTQ plus communities and, um, addiction. So addiction happens at disproportionate rates in LGBTQ populations. There's a lot of things that current drug and alcohol literature don't look at for different populations, different resources, different safe resources and things like that. So basically I made the made a brochure. I think I made two, two or three like different ones with um, one pertaining to maybe like alcohol, one opioids, um, maybe one with marijuana. And uh, I would bring that brochure to all different populations. Um, I brought it to social work students, I brought it to med students, I brought it to L different LGBTQ populations, brought it to public health students, and every single time I bring this brochure, I would get it evaluated because a big component to health education is evaluating your program or your literature or whatever you know pro product you're coming up with. Um, and every time I would get suggestions from each different population on how to make it better, and I ended up with probably like 11 drafts over time, but I ended up with this product that I was really proud of at the end um, that they were able to uh, have available for people if they needed it. Probably at this point, it's not available anymore and it's probably out of date at this point, um, but it was really cool to be able to put health education into motion essentially. Um, creating this material and getting it evaluated by all these different populations to something that could be useful for people. Um, and that was really cool. Um, it was it was it was good to be able to use um, my knowledge here at the health department with my field work. Yeah, and, and I think it's also it's always awesome when you're able to like do work specifically as an intern and see the completion of that work or see it like go into action. So, so yeah, that, that, that that's great. And then also during your MPH, you were a student volunteer at the Rutgers University, well, at Rutgers University, um, and I think you were on a Dominican Republic outreach project. So tell, tell me about that. Oh, that was such an amazing experience. And actually, again, I mentioned Facebook memories before. I was actually in the Dominican Republic in 2015, like right now at, the, at this time. So I'm thinking about that trip a whole lot. Um, they don't have the class anymore. 
uh, but it was, or they don't have the same version of the class again um, at, at Rutgers, but it was basically a global um, public health program. And it was just referred to as the Dominican Republic project, um, like amongst students and things like that. And a certain amount of students, usually like 10, 11, 12 students would do this per spring semester. So it was only a spring program. And obviously you were in classes the entire semester, but you would be learning about how to bring health education and public health in general to different populations around the world. So had like a developing countries aspect to it, just a global public health aspect. We did a whole lot of stuff um, regarding vector borne illnesses. And we talked a lot about um, deworming and parasites and um, again, handing out like um, safe sex items to all different populations. All of this preparation to go to the Dominican Republic for a week and work with the um, both Dominican Republic, but also the Haitian population living um, in the Bates. In we were in Puerto Plata. I'm just saying that wrong. My terrible accent, but Puerto Plata in in the Dominican Republic. Um, there's a whole history of uh, Haitians working in the sugarcane fields in the Dominican Republic, and once that um, industry stopped. Uh, these different populations of Haitians were left in the Dominican Republic with no real way to access education, jobs, healthcare, anything like that. So we worked with an awesome organization called Blanco's Kids. Um, this gentleman, Blanco, would work, he would kind of spot work to sponsor um, specific children, um, get them a uniform to go to school, get them food, get them health care. Um, people could obviously donate to the program to get these kids to school because essentially if they weren't able to go to school, they weren't able to get jobs and ultimately move out of these bates, move out of these sugarcane fields. Um, so we got to go and visit them all over, um, again, all over the Puerto Plata area. Um, we would bring, um, we do the deworming. We would literally just sit and play with the kids. Um, we would bring we would bring them safe sex things. Um, we would we also got to go to um, like a, a hospital, um, see how that was different from you know the United States healthcare. Uh, we got to go to an HIV and AIDS clinic um, in in the city and see how you know the main city and see how that worked. Um, and then at the very end, this is kind of like a, a almost like a little silly thing, but really to me it. it it probably made those kids week, day, whatever it was. Um, we got to throw like a little beach party for them at the very end. Um, and then a component to that was that they came to the beach party. Um, we had a, a public health dental student with us and she would do, she did some teeth cleaning. Um, again, we did some like deworming things there, but it was basically just to give these kids um, a really fun like little beach party experience, get them out of their their villages for a little bit just so they can have fun and it was a really cool experience I again since that was what was it seven years ago again math is not my strong suit um it was that however many years ago I, I wonder how those kids that we worked with I wonder how they're doing I hope hope they kept going to school I hope the groups that went after us were able to see them and just work with them again. It was a really cool experience. I didn't get to study abroad when I was at Temple because again, I switched my major a little bit late. Um, so I kind of missed the boat on studying abroad somewhere. So I was able to get this little study, it wasn't really study abroad, but I got this little global health experience and it was awesome. Unfortunately, again, I don't think the program, um, I don't think Rutgers does it anymore. Um, and Dr. Grau, who was the um, former professor that we worked with who lived in the Dominican Republic, she passed away a couple of years ago. So I'm not sure if that connection is there anymore. Um, I went on the website to see if like Blanco's kid still exists and I don't know if it does anymore. Um, so I just hope, I, th th that program really had an impact on me, just kind of the unfairness of, of it and not being able to not being able to have a job or go to school just because you don't have a uniform or you know not being able to access health care even if you grew up in that area of the country i don't know it was it was a a very eye-opening experience to say the least
Yeah, I, mean, I, I can only imagine. And that, that must have been great to just get to, to travel and do that type of work, uh, especially during your, your master's program. Um, so I appreciate you sharing that as well. Were there any other takeaways that you had from your MPH program that you wanted to share before we get into the role that you currently have? Always keep receipts of everything that you do, whether it's in work or in school. Um, always pay very, very close attention to when classes are offered, um, what classes you're taking. Make sure to have a really good relationship. This, this also goes for undergraduate. Have a good relationship with your school counselor if, if you're able to have one and work with one. Um, make sure you know what the curriculum setup is like. Um, there were a couple instances, not even just with, not even just me, but with you know, my fellow students, they would not be able to take a course in the spring because it was only offered in the fall. And then they would have to stay another year or something like that in order to complete their course, or they would have to do their field work in the summer when people weren't really on campus and able to help them out. Um, I mentioned that Rutgers and umd &J were merging when I was a student there and unfortunately that did result in some confusion and some chaos as I was graduating. Um, I almost ended up not being able to present my field work at my final presentation. And the only reason I was able to is because I had some really good relationships with professors who stood up for me. And like the very first thing I said is keep receipts. I know that sounds kind of cheesy and a little silly and almost petty in a way, but um, that type of stuff can really help you and uh, defend you if ever need be. Okay, I appreciate that. that and that, that's some great, great takeaways and uh, good <laughs> advice for everyone. And, and I think like just generally keeping risky so like what the things you're doing and, mm -hmm. and all of that is, is just great because life goes on and we forget a lot of things that happen. So, so it's, it's always yeah. awesome. Um, okay, so you work as a community program coordinator at Bernard's Township Health Department. You've been there for, for quite a bit now. How, how has your role transformed? Um, and, and I guess I guess I, I say that before, like, how has the role transformed up until COVID? Because I'm guessing things changed at that point. So I, my job here is absolutely incredible. Um, so I'm a health educator here. I'm the community programs coordinator. Um, one of the things, one, one of the many things that I do here is I uh, coordinate two grants. Uh, one is the Municipal Alliance Grant and one is the Youth Services Commission Grant. Um, basically, both of those grants work towards working with youth in the community, um, doing substance misuse information, um, working with at-risk populations, uh, and managing those two grants. And then the Municipal Alliance and also involves a volunteer coalition that I work with. Um, so I manage the grant, I help run the volunteer coalition and then all the programs that are kind of um, done through both of those grants. Uh, so I kind of have like a cycle that I go through every year. And again, it's not, um, not like a boring cycle where it's like the same thing over and over again. I have programs that happen every single year, you know, kind of like milestone things. I mentioned Bernard's does a lot in the spring. Um, there's a celebration here called Charter Day. Um, it's like a downtown like festival. Um, there's vendors and there's rides and food and games and all that type of stuff. And it sounds like what the heck does the health department have to do with that? But we have a table where we talk about our municipal alliance programs. Um, we, you know, technically we have to inspect it. I don't do the inspections, but that's part of, that's why the health department's involved. Um, one of the fundraisers that we do for the Municipal Alliance is a 5K race that happens in June called the Twilight Challenge. Um, so managing that, again, who would think that a health educator had to do anything with uh, race directing, but that's part of my job. Um, and then providing health education programs for the community. So part of the grant does go towards a stipend for me or a, um, a consultant fee for me to do programs. Um, so I am a master certified health education specialist or an MCHES. Um, as long as I feel comfortable with the subject matter, I can do a health education presentation on my own or I can look for an expert in the matter. Um, a lot of times, I mean, I would say more, I would say it's actually 50-50-ish. Um, I feel like I'm able to do a lot of programs, but I, you know, if it's something that I, a good example would be um, in 2018, we did a program on uh, ACEs and childhood trauma. 
that's something that is way over, not way over my head, but something that I don't think that I could properly explain to an audience of people. So we brought in and we worked with another organization to bring that program to the community. Um, we'll do documentary screenings, we'll do panel presentations. Um, one of my favorite programs that I did, again, where this is a very pivotal time of year apparently, but in 2014, 13 or 14, 14. We did a program called Cycle of Pills to Heroin. Um, our, our town unfortunately experienced a few opioid related overdoses um, in a very short amount of time. And so the community wanted to learn more about why, you know, what the, the cycle of pills to heroin, um, why are people getting addicted to pills and why is that switching to heroin? What can we do? How can we support people in recovery? How can we support people who are struggling with substance misuse? Um, we had a program of like 500 people up at our um, high school performing arts center that listened to this incredible panel speak and they watched a documentary and got a lot out of it. And then from that program, we were able to do like a couple little um, like special offshoot programs from that big one. So you have these things that are milestone that are always happening. Um, you know, drug trends are constantly changing. Mental health trends are constantly changing. So there's usually a big fall program, a big spring program, things like that, and little things in between. Um, I got trained as a youth mental health first aid instructor, and I was teaching classes um, for adults in the community who work with youth. We actually worked really closely with our school district in order to train administration. And we were in the process of training um, a lot of the other staff members in the schools, you know, um, other community leaders who worked with, um, with young people. And the one of the biggest parts of my job and one of the parts that I'm most proud of and most excited to work with, um, I have a group of high school students, I mentioned them before. Um, they're called Ridge Education Action and Community Health or REACH. Um, and it's a group of about 20, 25 high school students from Ridge High School, which is our high school in Bernard's Township. And they do um, substance misuse programming and mental health awareness um, in the community, mostly focusing in, in you know, the school since that's where they are most of the time. Um, but they lend the adolescent perspective on a lot of this. Um, and working with them is one of the best things. I get to take them to a leadership camp every summer. Um, called the Lindsay Meyer Teen Institute. That's half of this stuff that's behind me. Um, but the Lindsay Meyer Teen Institute empowers high school students to create positive change in their community through leadership and you know, um, learning self-acceptance and how to be your best self basically without the use of alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs. Um, so I bring a group of students to this five-day, it's usually a five-day leadership conference. It happens in August. And uh, they, it's a, it's a life-changing week for these kids. They get to do workshops and they listen to incredible speakers. And then they bring the information that they learn at camp back into the community. Um, and they, I let them pick every year what we're going to do. High school kids will only work on what high school kids like. Um, so I'm not gonna make them do something that they don't wanna do. If they wanna focus on environment and talking about recycling, we're going to do that. If they want to focus on vaping prevention, we're going to do that. If they want to focus on mental health, we'll focus on that. Um, so a lot of the youth programming that I do, um, whether it's that or other things through the Youth Services Commission grant, that's like the coolest stuff that I get to do. So when COVID hit, unfortunately, since a lot of this was in-person programming, whether it be the meetings, the 5k, you know, the vendor fairs, the workshops, all of that, um, all of that had to come to an end for two, re not an end forever, but it came to a halt, not only because it was, it wasn't safe to meet in person, but that was when the health educator part of my job really had to kick in um, and work with the community. I think everybody in my department, whether they are a health inspector, whether they are animal control officer, whether they're a health educator or a nutritionist, um, we all had to come together and start working on COVID things, um, whether it be contact tracing, talking to members of the community, talking to the schools, talking to long-term care facilities. It was really an all hands on deck, deck type of thing. And that meant not being able to do a lot of the things that we once were able to. Um, that doesn't mean that our um, public health services completely stopped. So our inspectors were incredible and they were able to keep you know, doing construction inspections, they were able to keep um, uh, inspecting restaurants and doing food licenses and things like that. But a lot of our health education programs 
had to pivot. I think that's like the magical word that everyone says for COVID related things. We had to pivot to educating the community about COVID um, and doing things like that. So it really was a it was really sad because I, you saw how I just talked about all that and how excited a lot of that makes me. Um, and again, no one wants a pandemic to ever happen. Uh, we talk about it in you know, like microbiology class and things like that. We learn about cholera, we learn about the Spanish flu, we learn about all these things. We never think about it actually happening. Um, but you know, we're, I don't wanna say we were trained to do this, but you know, we, we had this in mind. Um, and being able to be there for the community was a really, I said eye-opening before when I was talking about the Dominican Republic experience, but this was a really eye-opening and um, honorable experience to be able to be there for our community in the ways that we were. Um, but that's not to say that it wasn't hard. It was really tough to let go of a lot of the programs um, that we weren't able to do anymore. And now we're, we're just being able to do them again. You know, this year we're kind of Nothing about the pandemic, it's not over, but we do have the tools to mitigate it a little bit easier now and address certain things um, so that we can do some of our old programming. Um, so I, again, I forget if we were recording yet, but basically, you know, today I didn't have to do too much COVID stuff. I was working on our annual report where I talked about COVID, but you know, I answered, I think, uh, one or two emails from schools asking questions, but then I got to work on stuff for the Twilight Challenge. I got to do some stuff for my high school students, you know, being able to be able to do that again is really good. So it was a, it was a slap in the face for the entire world, but health departments, especially, I think felt, again, not to rank anybody by who felt things worse or better or anything like that, but it was definitely, we were definitely hit really hard. Yeah, yeah, I, I can only imagine. And yeah, I definitely saw you light up as you're speaking about the programming that you do with the kids. And uh, like, it's really sad that that all had to stop. Um, but thank you all for doing the work to, to pivot, as you said, into doing the COVID <laughs> stuff and doing that, that hard work to learn more about it and share that information with the community and do all the other preventative uh, things. And I'm glad that we are at a stage when things are, are, are starting to get back more to where you can do the things that uh, make you excited in, in the role that, that you're doing. Um, so you, you mentioned that you have your M chairs. Um, where, what was that thought process for, for both getting your chairs and then your M chairs? And for people that might know, the M chairs is the Master Certified Health Education Specialist. Um, so I sat for my CHES exam, uh, I think it was March or April of 2012. So as I was graduating, again, I was doing a lot that year, apparently. And again, I don't know how I balanced all that, but you know, I was taking the GRE, taking the CHES exam, applying to grad school, and you know, somehow graduating all during that too. Um, I knew it was something that I wanted. I thought, it, I think at the time it was... Uh, I'm going to graduate and I'm going to have letters after my name, Woo which, hey, that's cool. It's fun to have a couple letters after your name. It's not the end all be all, but it's, it's, it's fun. Um, I like when people ask what it is and then I get to explain it a little bit more. Um, I also feel like it does give, um, you don't have to have a CHES or an M CHES in order to be a health educator. That's really important to note because there are health educators out there that have been working in the field for years and they don't have a CHES or an M CHES. And that's totally fine. Um, I thought going into the health education field, this is something that I wanted to do for myself. This is a um, credential that I want to have to be the best version of myself. I was very lucky because Temple had a really great, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, po uh, program planning and um, pro program planning and implementation and evaluation class. That was our capstone. I mentioned writing a 90 page grant. Uh, that was it. Uh, that was our, we had to pick a um, health problem or public health problem that we wanted to address. We had to basically pretend to write a grant for, I think it was something like a hundred thousand dollars. And we had to pick a place, a location, we had to hire people, we had to write a budget, we had to pretend that the program was implemented, we had to pretend that the program was being evaluated, all of that, the whole pre-seed, proceed, all of that. Um, 
And that was a big part of the chess exam. And I remember going into the chess exam and going, oh my gosh, Temple prepared me so well for this. I was very thankful. Um, but that was that was mostly the chess. So I graduated, um, got found out, I think, July of that year that I had gotten it and started using my letters. I was all excited. And then um, as I got my, you have to do continuing education credits for the chess. Um, I noticed that the M chess was a thing that existed. It's a master version, master version of it, basically. Um, a whole different set of health education competencies, um, really focusing on almost like beyond the evaluation and program implementation is the best way to describe it. Um, and after graduating with my master's in public health, I thought, I would say might as well go for the M Ches, but it felt like the next logical step for me as a health educator was to get my M Ches. I believe I sat for that in the spring of 2019. I was very nervous because at that point I had been out of, um, I'd been out of school for a couple of years at that point, at least when I took my Ches, I was graduating from Temple. So I was at least used to taking tests. 2019, um, at that point, I'd been graduated from Rutgers for three years at that point. I don't even know how to fill out a Scantron anymore, uh, but everything went well, obviously. Um, I'm very proud of being a Ches. I'm very proud of being an M Ches. Um, it's definitely a credential that I would recommend to any individual who has anything to do with health education. I realize that's a very broad statement, but I feel like the concepts behind Ches in general, like, you know, just as, as a whole, I feel like that's very important for anybody who does any um, public health programming at all to know all that, to know those steps and know what's important into creating a good public health program, being able to implement it, being able to, you know, evaluate it, see what needs to be changed and beyond, basically. Uh, I highly recommend it. I, I And I think it makes sense um, if you can do it very soon after graduating from your undergrad, if you're able, so all that information is fresh in your mind. Um, a lot of health educator jobs do look for a CHES certification. Some may even um, help you out. If you do pass it, they'll pay for the, you know, test, they'll reimburse you for the test fee, um, things like that. And I, and I really just love any CHES program that I, I get credits, that I get CHES program credits for is always something really fun and interested. I love going to public health conferences. Um, I'm part of the Society for Public Health Education and New Jersey Society for Public Health Education or Educators. Um, and anytime I go to one of those conferences, I kind of geek out a little bit because all these people are interested in the same stuff I am. And I look through, it, it's kind of that feeling that I had when I looked at the public health curriculum at Temple. I look through the, the um, program pamphlet. I'm thinking, all these workshops sound so good. I want to go to all of them, but I can't go to all of them. That would be impossible. But, you know, um, the continuing education aspect is really important because um, I don't think you can ever be stagnant as a health educator. You always have to learn about what's going on, um, new trends and whatever health education topic you're talking about. So again, for me, it's like youth services and mental health, substance misuse. That's stuff that you always have to keep tabs on. You have to know what's new. I don't want to say what's exciting because some of the stuff is not technically like in a positive way exciting, but what's new, what's trending, what can you get educated in to bring to your community or whatever organization that you work with. Maria, thank you for sharing that. And uh, that that does help. And I hope it's very helpful for a lot of uh, health educators or future health educators out there to, to really think that through. And you There's mentioned so many resources now, too. I just have to say that real quick. Sorry to cut you off. No. Um, in 2012, I think um, there's, you know, there's a study guide that exists. And I went through the study guide with like a highlighter. That's how I did that. By the time I studied for my MCHES in 2019, the amount of like study groups that exist on the internet, on like forums, um, there's Instagram pages that are dedicated to studying for the CHES and the MCHES. Uh, if, if any possible CHES prospect is worried about being able to study for it or trying to find a study buddy, it is extremely possible, which is really 
really helpful. I think, um, again, I was kind of, I had a couple friends that were also studying for it at Temple, um, again, back in 2012. Uh, I feel like I don't even need a person in, I don't need a person in person. If I were to study for it today, I can find every, anything and everything I need online. So many good resources. Yeah, that, that's for sure. The, the resources are very accessible these days and, and they are uh, very numerous as well. Yeah. Uh, so so you, you touched on being a part of the New Jersey chapter of the SOFIE uh, Society of Public Health Educators, and I believe you're the membership chair. So how do you get involved as membership chair and then what, what are your responsibilities? As I mentioned Dr. Taylor earlier for getting me, uh, you know, connecting me to the health department. She did the same thing for um, for for NJ Sophie. So she said, if you're going back to New Jersey, this is a really great resource. You should join. So I just joined as a member right out of college. Um, I looked at the time. I thought, should I join the Pennsylvania one or should I join the New Jersey one? Because again, I didn't know where I was going to be. Um, I just joined NJ Sophie. Um, my supervisor is actually, she was the first NJ Sophie president. So when I came here and I said, Hey, I'm interested in joining NJ Sophie. She was very supportive. She's a member herself as well. Um, so it was very good to have that support for joining a, you know, a, a an organization like that. Uh, I joined the board originally. Uh, I wanted to do uh, students and new professionals. So I worked on that for a few years. And then once I was comfortable at the health department and comfortable in myself as a health educator in general, um, I joined the program planning committee. I ended up being the program chair for a year or two, um, switched over to continuing education because again, that's a passion of mine as a health educator. I then served as chapter delegate for a few years um, leading into COVID. And then right now um, I'm the membership chair. Uh, serving on the board is something that I don't take lightly. I really um, appreciate the entire board. I love working with them. Um, I like being a resource in NJ Sophie because I remember being nervous as a, you know, a freshly graduated professional gosh, well, what, what do I join? How, like, how do I, how do you humanize these big professional organizations? It's a little, it's a little nerve, it's a little nerve wracking. So being able to be someone like reach out, Hey, how are you doing? Welcome. Do you want to get involved in any, any specific, um, you know, committees in NJ Sophie? You don't? Okay, cool. I'll be here for you if you want. Here's my information. Um, and then just being able to kind of like the behind the scenes stuff, being able to like reach out to people for, different items. I'm the person who signs a lot of the purchase orders. And so you get to know people through those like little, little interactions as well. Um, and I basically help a lot with, um, I basically help. That sounds really, I don't mean to sound so pompous. I, uh, I'm, I also help a lot with, um, the program planning and basically any area that I can help with, um, with the board. Cause it's something I'm very passionate about. Well, that's awesome. And yeah, that's, that's awesome that you would have like supervisors and people that were involved and like encourage you to get involved because I think that it's a great way for especially for young professionals and, and students as well to, to get involved mm -hmm. and to, to see what, what is out there for whether that's health education or whatever other type of organization you join just to see and network with people that are doing this work and, and get new opportunities and as well as just building out your network to to, to whatever possibilities are out there, you know? And it's definitely a trial and error. Um, there's a lot of um, professional organizations I'd like to be a part of that maybe just haven't. Um, this, so sorry, APHA. I have, I'm not an APHA member. I should be. Um, I keep meaning to join. And um, there was one year the conference was in Philly and I kicked myself for not going that year just to, just to go. Um, you know, you might join something and you'll, you're, you give your membership dues and you're like, well, what, what am I getting out of this? And, you know, my, it, I'm never, it's never a waste because it's always like a lesson, um, but it might take a little bit to find the professional organization that you feel most at home and par a part of. I miss, um, we haven't done a in-person, an in-person NJ Sophie meeting again since um, the end of 2019, which it's unfortunate because the end of 2019 was our 35th anniversary celebration. So it was a really fun time. And um, not only did we get to do our conference and, you know, again, geek out over health education things, but then we celebrated, you know, we went to a little restaurant afterwards and, 
you know, celebrated with one another that NJ Sophie has existed for 35 years, had a great time. You know, this feel, it feels like family. It feels like a big group of friends. It always feels like a reunion whenever we get together. Um, and then COVID put an end to a lot of um, in-person things. So I miss seeing those people um, in person and connecting the way that we do. Uh, you know, there's virtual networking and we've done, um, I got to say, our program planning committee has done an amazing job transferring, um, again, pivoting. A lot of organizations have done a great job doing online programming, but really NJ Sophie, the program committee has done a really good job um, providing those, you know, continuing education programs and credits and things like that virtually. We have some really good programs. Um, it's also been cool, the one, this is like one little thing. It, we've had people from all over the United States attend our NJ Sophie meetings now, which wouldn't have been a thing, um, you know, if COVID didn't happen and it wasn't virtual. Somebody from Texas isn't going to fly out to come to an NJ Sophie conference, although they should. Um, it, being able to meet different people and have that little networking aspect with people from around the country is really cool. Uh, but it, ta it, it takes some trial and error to find the professional organization that you're most at home with. And it doesn't even have to be like a warm, fuzzy at home feeling, as long as it's one that you enjoy and you enjoy the product that you're getting from them with your membership dues. That's really the most important thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you highlighted that because they are many 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 professional organizations out there so really thinking through like what are you going to get from it and how is it going to like help you build that network and as you said it might be a little bit of trial and error maybe just reaching yeah. out to people who are in in the organizations and seeing what they benefit from it and what their impressions are as well and NJ Sophie is really, really good again for um, the continuing education credits, which once you once you get something like a Ches, you go, oh my gosh, now I have to I have to maintain this uh, this credential. How do I do that? Uh, it's both National Sophie, NJ Sophie, and then really all the other chapters. They offer really great programs, again, ones that you can geek out over because you're excited about the topic. Um, and they also have a really good job bank. So that's really helpful for our students and new professionals or anyone you know, looking to you know, switch over different uh, public health careers and things like that. Those are the two big main things. Um, and then I really do think that the whole networking aspect, um, especially in person is really beneficial. Um, you can, you know, the, you can come to our meetings and stuff as a non-member, but being a member is really, really where it's at. Sure, sure. I have to say that. Not I have to say that. I have to say that, but I feel like I'm really biased and I'm going to say that because I love NJ Sophie so much. <laughs> yeah, as you should, as you should, as you should. And then you also have a disaster response crisis counselor certificate, I think it is. So to tell me, tell me a little bit more about that. So that just felt like to, to, to explain that, I first have to explain um the youth mental health first aid certification in a way, because uh it really all kind of tied together. Um, unfortunately, in 2016, our town suffered um, the loss of a couple of young people in town um, to suicide, which was really tough, not only on the whole school community, but I saw how it affected my students. Um, there were some of the students I worked with personally, I'd taken to camp and, you know, been involved as their advisor. And that had a profound impact on me. And I thought, you know, we're so proactive in all different areas in public health. Um, and I know there's people who are proactive in areas in mental health, but I thought mental health is so important to me. I, like I mentioned, I'm really very interested in health behavior, health behavior and psychology. Thought, why am I not doing more as a health educator to be more proactive in the areas of mental health? Um, so I had gotten certified as a youth mental health first aid, first aider. I had gotten certified as a mental health first aider, so adults and then um, you know adult who works with young people. Bernard's Township actually um, sponsored me. What's the right word? They supported me in going to um, be trained as a youth mental health first aid instructor. Uh, so I had that under my belt, and I mentioned that I worked um, different parts of the community to educate and. Um, make you know, different uh, community leaders, mental health first aiders, and be able to use um, those lessons you know, in, their, in their everyday life, their professional life, wherever they worked with young people. So I had that already. And I learned about the DRCC certification through Somerset County. And I thought it just made, it made sense, kind of in the same way where um, 
I looked at the public health curriculum and it all made sense. I looked at the courses that were necessary to become a DRCC. And I thought it worked perfectly in areas of mental health. So it is a, um, a DRCC would respond in a, I don't want to call anything like a small scale disaster, because again, you, have, you put the word disaster in there and something bad is happening. Something is affecting people, but smaller scale incidents. So things like house fires, um, Hurricane Ida hit a lot of the United States, but you know that's that was an example of when DRCCs were called out. Um, we had a lot of flooding in New Jersey, um, so DRCCs responded, talking to people who were impacted by the hurricane. Um, a lot of like natural disasters and things like that. Um, that's where DRCCs come in um, and are able to talk to people. So things like psychological first aid, um, responding in a time of disaster, having that mental health component tying that with the emergency preparedness portion of my job here at the health department, um, where I work with the Office of Emergency Management, again, on different projects, it all tied together and it made sense, again, to make me the best version of me myself as a health educator outside of Bernard's Township, but then also as an employee of the township, I thought it was a valuable credential to have to help um, help my community, basically. I have not had to deploy um, currently at this time. Um, they did call people out for DRCC, but unfortunately I was impacted by Hurricane Ida myself, so I was not able to respond in that case. Um, but if we ever do need, um, need it in Bernard's Township, I'm here to be able to respond. And that's another um, credential that the continuing education has been really important. Uh, and the topics have been very interesting. So being able to get that continuing education and have this credential to be able to help the community, it all, again, I know I keep saying it all ties together, it all kind of, it, it all makes sense, but that's really what it, what it comes down to. And I look at my credentials, I look at them and I think, I don't just see them as letters after my name. I know my master's in public health means that, you know, I looked at health education, I made it my priority, it still is my priority, obviously. Um, I mastered it. I always think it's funny. It's who made me a master in something, but, you know, I looked at health education as my priority. And I know that, um, again, my MCHES, that's me as a health education specialist. That's my duty as a health educator to be the most educated that I can be to be the best version of myself as a health educator for the community. And then the DRCC just ties everything together, especially pertaining to the emergency preparedness and mental health aspect to it. So it all ties together, as I've said like five times. <laughs> Sorry. No, 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 no. And I, I like <laughs> that. I like that because like it, it really goes to show like you were kind of strategic in thinking about this, or or like at least it naturally fell strategically to you. Like this was something that's, that's a good happened. way to put it, actually. Yeah, it was very strategic. <laughs> yeah, because this was something that was happening in the community. You're like, oh, how can I like better get trained in this to better like help the community and and those are the ways that you use it as well as just using it as a way to continue to gain education around these topics that are important to you and uh, can be helpful to the community um, additionally um, so it's stigmatizing topics sometimes like mental health doesn't still doesn't get talked about enough still doesn't get talked about the way it needs to it's still a topic that people like don't, don't, don't go into that too much. Don't go into too much detail. We don't need to. Um, I have noticed a difference. I think in, in the world at large is less afraid to talk about mental health, but just on the ground level where I see it in my, in the communities that I work with in, with my students talking about mental health. Um, one of the things that we talk about in mental health first aid is, you know, if you break your arm and you have a cast, everybody signs the cast, people offer to carry your books. They make sure that you're doing okay. They make sure that, you know, hey, do you need help with anything? I can cook you food. I can do X, Y, and Z for you. Um, but if somebody is struggling with depression or they're having suicidal ideation, they don't get the same attention that it really, you know, mental and physical health really are, they're both very important components and we don't treat mental health the same way that we treat physical health. Um, but I do think not only this on the community I work with, I think as a whole, as a society, I think it's talked about a little bit more. I think a lot of that is due to things like social media and having access to that information. But uh, I, I hope we continue as a society to talk more about mental health, basically. 
Yeah, and I think that that's also important because it it isn't uh, taken as seriously as as physical health uh, in a lot of sense, just because people can't see that the, that you can see that you you broken your arm, but it's kind of hard to to grapple with like depression and anxiety and and those those other uh, things that people do suffer with um, on a daily. But yeah, as especially during the pandemic, I think it has shown a light on mental health and I think we're going to see like implications of what the pandemic has done to the population's mental health as well because uh, that is very interesting and on this point um, I knew that you wanted to speak a little bit on uh, neurodivergence in school and in the workplace so I wanted to give you some space for that. So um, I have talked about this a whole lot more recently so when I was in I think second or third grade I was diagnosed with ADHD at the time I think uh, you know ADHD in general um, is a very misrepresented um, mental health challenge and I call it mental health challenge because again that's my um, youth mental health first aid training um, I felt like if somebody had told me when I was younger, hey, your brain just works a little bit differently than people, and that's okay, other than other people, and that's okay. You know, we're gonna work with you the best way that we know how to help you, whether it be through school or forming relationships, um, anything, anything like that. So I, in high school, uh, kind of ignored it a little bit. I didn't really take it seriously. I went to like doctors, like I was supposed to. And then once I went into college, I thought I'm too good for all of this. I'm just going to go through life without medication, without thinking about it very much. Um, and I think it caught up with me a little bit and, um, you know, going back to balancing grad school and working and, you know, life in general, um, I ended up going through a time in my life where anxiety was really prevalent. Um, I'm not afraid to say it's definitely an anxiety disorder of some kind, um, I see a therapist, I see a psychiatrist, both of whom are amazing. Um, and they help me work through all of these things. I take medication for my mental health. I'm not afraid to say that I take medication. Cause again, if you take an allergy pill, you talk about it, it's fine. Whatever you take a multivitamin, it's fine, whatever. But the second you tell someone that you take Adderall, you're either judged thinking, you know, people think that you're abusing it or why do you need that in order to, you know, go to work and go to school and things like that. Um, I just do my best to talk about it and be open. I talk about my depression, my anxiety, my ADHD, like I would anything else, like my lunch order or something, something simple and mundane just to enter it into the conversation. Uh, and I encourage other people to do that too. If, um, you know, my students need a mental health day or something, if anybody in my life needs a mental health day, you know, that's the same thing as a sick day to me. Um, that's something that should be taken seriously. Uh, and I just, I hope that again, as this is like, I was just saying in the last, um, little conversation, I hope as a society, we move forward and we take these things seriously. I hope things like ADHD are taken seriously and not looked at as a joke. Cause I think for a long time it was for some reason. Um, I don't think it's diagnosed enough. I, th uh, I think there's a misconception that it's, di it's, uh, di it's um, diagnosed too much. I don't think it's diagnosed enough. I think there's a lot of adults who later on in life realize um, that they do have ADHD or they do have another mental health challenge that maybe would have made certain things in their life a little bit easier. Uh, I certainly think maybe college and grad school would have been a little bit easier had I taken my own mental health a little bit more seriously. Uh, and I just encourage anyone listening, you know, if you are not, you know, if, you, if you're thinking about seeing a therapist or you're thinking about seeing a psychiatrist or, or really anybody, a therapist of any kind, and you are wondering if it's the right thing to do, um, I obviously finances and health insurance and things like that are definitely a constraint. But if you have the ability to go see a therapist and you want to, I just encourage everyone to take the time for their mental health. Take the time for all aspects of your health. Don't forget to get your um, like annual physical and all that. Go see a specialist if you need like specialist things. But, but really, your mental health is something that's really important and should be focused on. I'm not saying that you have to take the magic pill to cure everything, but you know, learn about DBT therapy. To, like just talk to a non-biased third party, basically. 
little things like that can really, really help. And just, I encourage anyone, any age, any time, it's not too late to um, work on your mental health, basically. Yeah, I appreciate that transparency and sharing about that because it is it is something that, as you said, is so like stigmatized and looked down upon when it is something that is very real. It's here and we need to talk about it so that we can come up with better solutions and better ways to, to solve yeah. the issue as well as like give space for people to to like deal with that and understand that it's okay that they are dealing with that in a certain type of way. Um, so yeah, I, I appreciate you sharing that. And then on another note, uh, you, as I mentioned in the intro, you were a 40 under 40 in public health by the De Beaumont Foundation. So congratulations, first of yeah. all. And then uh, talk, talk to me a little bit more about being selected in and, and uh, what, what came with that. So I actually came out through um, National Sophie. There was just a, um, like a an email that came out that you know the new cohort was going to be selected. I thought, you know, what? I am under 40. I think I've done a pretty good job in the last couple of years. Um, why not? You know, I don't, I've been told by people, I don't toot my own horn enough. I'm trying to be better at that. I'm trying to acknowledge that I love public health. I love health education and I'm pretty okay at what I do. See, like, I just, I don't, I, it's, 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 it's hard to, it's hard to talk about yourself sometimes. I know I've been talking about myself for like the last hour, but um you know, like when you go to an interview and they say, tell me about yourself, you're like, I don't know anything about myself. How do I even word it? <laughs> but um, it was, yeah, and I thought it was perfect. It was a chance for local, local leaders in public health or local people that, you know, work in public health to kind of show off what they've been doing the last year um, as a whole in general, the work, the important things that they've been doing with their community. Um, I filled out the form. I didn't really think anything of it because you, know, you never really expect, you, you hope for things, but you never really expected. And I was selected and I was really, really excited. Um, so far, we've had a meeting where we've gotten like the whole cohort together. We're all on LinkedIn, always commenting on each other's things all the time. I can't wait till we get to work together again. Um, it's a very beautiful thing. All of us have worked really hard through COVID in doing COVID things and non-COVID related things. And I think anytime, this goes for really any profession, probably not even just during COVID, but the, I'm just speaking from a local health educator's perspective or a local health department's perspective during the pandemic. When I talk to other local public health people in really any part of the country, uh, I feel a kinship. I feel like we can you know, vent about the same things. I feel like we can boast about the same things. I feel like we can connect on a very, um, a very deep level. And I felt that way with my cohort. And um, one big thing that we really want to talk about and that De Beaumont really wants to project for us is burnout um, with public, with the public health workforce. Um, we've all healthcare in general, but again, just speaking from the public health um, aspect, in the last two years, it's been all COVID all the time. If you're not talking about COVID at work, you go home, you sit on the couch and somebody texts you about COVID. Now I don't mind answering my friends and family's questions because I want them to be educated and I want to be able to help them, but it's the same thing all the time. And like we were talking about earlier, um, it, it, it can be really easy to lose your love for something when another part of your job is being so taxing. So for anyone who says that, you know, public health is going to be irrelevant after the pandemic is over, and this is going off a little bit of a tangent, uh, they're obviously a person who doesn't understand all aspects of public health. And I try to very nicely explain that to them, but you wouldn't want to talk about one very specific part of your job for two years mm -hmm. and only that. Um, so that I say, we don't want to just talk about communicable disease for two years. I don't want to talk about one single coronavirus for two years, let alone, but anyways, so, um, we really want to talk about, um, helping public health people, uh, public health professionals, um, pertaining to burnout. What can we do to support 
public health professionals, especially people working at the local level who have had that community interaction for such a long time. Um, again, love our communities. We want to give them the best of ourselves as you know, health educators to them and give them the best information possible. But um, the again, pandemic is not over, but we're, you know, as things die down, knocking on wood, um, and continue to continue to decrease. It's kind of like we're being, um, this tornado has moved away and we're all kind of standing there all disheveled and thinking, okay, well, what do we do? How do we go back to everything that we were doing prior to the pandemic? You know, how can we talk about vaping prevention? How can we talk about underage drinking prevention? How can I go back to, you know, teaching youth mental health first aid when we feel like the last two years have really had a, such a, like a huge impact on us? Uh, so I hope that the the cohort from this year is going to be able to speak more about that and um, be able to offer support to other you know, local health educated um, local public health professionals around the country. Okay, well that that is awesome, and I, I do hope that you'll get to get together in person or, or however that works. And um, congratulations again, that's a, a huge honor, and I'm I'm looking forward to seeing that work because it's definitely very important. And I, I like I like the point that you bring up, like who would want to be dealing with the same topic for two years? In their job? I saw I I kind of went off about this. Um, you probably saw it because I know we follow some of the same people on um, Instagram. And uh, I think, again, I don't remember exactly who shared it, but there was a, there was a tweet from someone somewhere, not from this person who we both follow, but somebody tweeted something to the effects of public health people want to prolong the pandemic because they're afraid that they're going to be irrelevant once COVID goes away. And, oh my gosh, my friends and family know I went off about this. <laughs> I do my best to say professional on even like my personal Instagram and things like that. But there are just some, some statements that just blow my mind. There's just some things that I've heard during this pandemic from people that just blow my mind. And that one just made me angry because that's clearly a person who doesn't understand public health and really hasn't been paying attention in my opinion, but prior to this, because I'll even admit, do, do, did I know what a, a health department did back in high school? Other than food inspections, really, I'm not 100% sure. However, we've seen public health in action for the past two years. It's been pretty much the only thing that's been talked about. And you really think that we're just going to like disappear into the shadows because yeah. the pandemic's coming to a close? I, and then I like I insert everything that, you know, insert healthy people 2020, insert healthy people 2030, like all these... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, <laughs> a, lot, a, lot of, a lot of other things to, to, to think about as well. Um, also, well, thank you for sharing that. Uh, so before I move you on to the Furious Five, I would like to ask you, where would you like to see yourself in the future? Oh, man. Um, I really, really like, I started everything with really, really. I, I, re I really enjoy working in local, local um, public health. I see myself I, I don't I don't even know if like in, in like a location or in a position necessarily I see myself um possibly gaining some more credentials I have no desire to go back to um higher education of any kind but there are other credentials that I'd like to pursue I've even thought about maybe a certificate in environmental health um I've thought about um sitting for my New Jersey health officer's license that's a possibility I would really like to oversee other health educators one day, maybe um, something to that effect. Uh, and I still want it to be at a local level. I don't see myself going to a county or a state unless something really opens up that I have a passion for. Uh, and that's not for any other reason than I really like working at the community level and seeing people. Um, I see myself continuing to be, you know, uh, continue to get my, my MCHES credentials, keeping my DRCC, something I'd really like to make sure that I pick up in the next, even not even a few years, but the next few months is I haven't been able to teach a, a youth mental health first aid class literally since 
like this time two years ago, I was teaching um, the physical education teachers um, from Bernard's Township. I was teaching uh, the mental health first aid with uh, one of the SACs over at our middle school, Jamie. And so she and I were, you know, she works for the school district. I work for the health department. We're doing this program and we're uh, presenting up at the board of education office. And the assistant superintendent came in and said, uh, we kind of need the room for the rest of the day. We have to discuss closing the school for, or closing the schools. Oh my gosh. I knew it was serious because obviously I had been talking COVID things prior to that, but that was really a moment where it kind of smacked all of us in the face, I think. Um, but I haven't been able to do a class since then. And that's something, like I said, I'm really passionate about. I really love teaching those classes. I love working with other instructors. Um, they've since revamped the curriculum, which is wonderful because obviously curriculums need to be up to date in order to give the best information to the public. Um, but I need to basically be retrained, um, which kind of stinks, but it's something, sorry, my email's going off. <laughs> um, I, I should have muted that, sorry. Um, I really hope I get to be a youth mental health first aid instructor again. I've even toyed around with the idea of getting my instructor credentials for um, regular mental health first aid. Uh, and just like on the same topic of, ment of, of mental health first aid, there's also a teen mental health first aid program that's being, it was technically in kind of a piloting stage, but I believe they're trying to push the program out more. And that basically helps uh, uh, high school students become mental health first aid ambassadors in their community and be able to you know, educate their peers, which I think is really important because that's really what my health education career boils down to. I enjoy helping empower people to make different decisions for their health behavior in any way, whether that be with a high school student, whether that be with a person in the community, um, anything, sorry, um, anything like that is just, um, is what I envision myself doing. Awesome, awesome. Well, we, we look forward to seeing uh, your, your continued journey and, and where that, that takes you. Uh, but that, that is definitely very exciting stuff. And I, I hope that you're able to do a lot more of the things that you were able to do uh, around this time two years ago. Um, so moving on to the Furious Five, the uh, five questions I ask all guests. Um, so okay. num <laughs> number one, what okay. advice would you give to a student trying to pursue a career in public health? Do it. <laughs> that's basically what it boils down to pursue it and go all in learn everything you can um to find your niche like i was talking about before uh give it a chance you know uh, things may not be completely clear at first you may have to take a couple of different classes you may have to you know do a couple of different interviews but if it's something that you're passionate about just go for it and do it awesome love, love it um, number two, if you were talking to someone wanting to get into your position, what advice would you give them? Networking is really important, especially with like, I guess like local government kind of in general, it's a whole different ball game in a way. Um, I think every you know, position has its little, ha has its own little pockets of networking and their own little, you know, everybody knows somebody type of thing, but definitely try to network. Um, and, you know, if, if it's not going to be at one specific department, it could be for another. If it's not the exact position you were looking for, it could be something different. Um, I'm not saying work for free, but, you know, interning is always an option or at least offering a project, um, you know, offer to do data entry or something. If, if it could be something remote, that's awesome too. Uh, and again, not to steal from the first question, just do it, just try it. Um, send that email, send that letter. Uh, I know we're still a little bit unsure about going in person to a whole lot of things, but stop by, see what's available. Uh, yeah. Great advice. Um, number three, what's something you are working on improving in your life right now? Giving myself the same amount of grace that I give everybody else and treating myself better in general. I'm really hard on myself. All my friends that are really listen to this are like, yeah, yeah, Kate, you do. Um, I am really hard on myself. I push myself a lot to 
be the best, you know, employee, be the best health educator. Um, I need to push myself to be the best, uh, Kate. That's my, I go by Kate in real life. <laughs> um, to be the best version of Kate that I possibly can be being a good friend, being a good daughter, being a good wife, being a good, you know, friend, everything like that. Um, I need to, uh, I'm working on balance, work-life balance, which I tell, um, you know, I feel like I've been in the field for 10 years. So I can say to people just starting to make sure you establish that work-life balance in the first place. I don't regret any Thing I've done in the last 10 years in terms of my job, but um, I do wish I had a little bit better work-life balance for myself. Yeah, I think that that's a great thing to work towards. Um, number four, professionally, do you recommend anything? Oh my gosh, like, um, I think just joining, a, a, maybe not in like particular, but um, obviously if you're a health educator in New Jersey, join NJ Sophie. Um, <laughs> I don't know how to word this properly. And again, without saying, just do it again. It's, I'm going to sound like Shia LaBeouf in that, like, uh, <laughs> in that, in that little meme. Just do it. Um, if you find something that you're passionate about in the professional field, go for it and be a part of it in any way you can. My really quick example for that is no matter where I end up in the next, you know, longevity of my career. I hope I work with LMTI for the rest of my life somehow, because it's something I'm really passionate about. Um, and I volunteer for them when I can, not even just again, as Caitlin, the health educator, I, I volunteer for them as Kate, I guess I have two different names now, but I volunteer for them as just Kate, the person, because it's something that I'm passionate about. Um, but I, again, I don't know if I recommend anything like it specifically, but join professional organizations, join volunteer groups and things like that about topics that you're passionate about and find ways to, if it's something in your personal life that you're passionate about, find a way to bring it in professionally. I don't know if that answered the question in the proper way, but. Yeah. Yep, you, you answered it perfectly. Uh, so thank you for that answer. Um, and then number five, last but not least, where can people connect with you? So I'm on LinkedIn. I uh, just search Caitlin Cartoccio. That's me. Um, if you look me up on Facebook, there's a, I have a work Facebook and a personal Facebook. Uh, feel free to friend me there if you want. Uh, I can give my, I can give my um, Instagram, but it's technically my personal one, but I kind of combine everything into, if you want to see pictures of my cats and of uh, my plants in my office and my students and my friends and things like that, that's where you go. Um, I did recently start not to like plug it too much that same day that I got really upset about um, public health people not being relevant because the pandemic's over thing. I actually started an Instagram called public health positive. I haven't been able to do as much as I want to on there. Um, but my whole goal is to just spread positivity as a health educator and about public health in general. My priority on there is local public health, um, local health departments and things like that, because that's what I know. And that's what I'm really passionate about. But um, to be continued, again, there's like maybe three posts on there. Lot. So LinkedIn, mostly. Yeah. Friend me. Yeah, awesome, awesome. I like talking to people from everywhere. <laughs> good, good, good. So I'll, I'll be sure to, to leave that information in the description and the show notes for anyone that is interested in that. And uh, yeah, thank, thank you so much for taking time coming on today and chatting with me and sharing uh, more about your story. Thanks for having me. It's been really cool. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's cool, cool for me as well. So, so I appreciate that. Um, some housekeeping items for everyone. Thank you so much for listening or watching to this, uh, or listening or watching this. I greatly appreciate <laughs> it. Whatever medium you're on. <laughs> Basically, yeah. Leave a like uh, if you're on a medium that leaves likes. Um, subscribe if you've not subscribed as yet. Leave a five star review. Let me know what you enjoyed about the show and share it with a friend so that someone else can get this information and navigate the public health journey just a little bit easier if you'd like to support you can go to the phmillennial.com forward slash support and find different ways to support there or like uh kate you can buy some uh, i was gonna tees. say if you weren't gonna say it i was gonna say <laughs> buy t-shirts 
Yeah, you can buy some t-shirts and mugs on my uh, website, thephmillennial.com. Um, I don't know if it's forward slash store or shop, but it's one of those. But you can just go to the website and find that. Well, thank you all so much for listening.